Hi everyone, I hope you're ready for this review session. Um, I've prepared a practice uh, final exam for you, but I want to point out that I've included more problems that there would be on the exam. I will include a list of the types of problems you can expect, but uh, with these problems, you shouldn't expect more than six in terms of length. All right, so let's look at the first problem. Suppose AX equals B reduces by the usual row row operations to the matrix or to the system ux equals c okay so what are we given we are given the matrix u over here and we are given how the vector c can be obtained from the vector b now you may think that it's very clear how to um reconstruct say L if we think of A as L times U. So U doesn't tell us what L is, U doesn't tell us what A is, but we could potentially get something from C, although one would have to think very carefully how C would be obtained from B. The point is we don't have A and we don't have B. We have U and C. Okay, so part A. Give a basis for the null space of A and a basis for the row space of A. Well, we are in luck because the null space of A is the same as the null space of U, and the row space of A, which is the column space of A transpose, is the same as the column space of U transpose. So even though I'm asking for these subspaces of the matrix A, they are actually the same corresponding subspaces of the matrix U. So there is not much to do here. Um, we already have a basis for the row space and perhaps I'll start there. So basis for the row space is going to be the set of the two rows that are not zero. So we have one, two, three, four, and zero, zero, three, four. So these two rows give us a basis for the row space of U. They also give us a basis for the row space of A because A and U have the same row spaces. Now for the null space, we actually do have to find the null space. Um, it's nice to look at the pivot columns because it tells you immediately what the rank of A is, which is the same as the rank of U, which is two. So we just need to have uh, two if we find two um, linearly independent solutions uh, that uh, or combinations of the columns that give us zero, then we have the null space. We can also continue with elimination, and perhaps that's what I'll do here. So what I'll do is I'll take the matrix U and get it all the way to R. So I have 1, 0, 0, 2, 0, 0, 3, 3, 0. 8, 4, 0, and I want to get to R. My pivots, the first pivot is a 1, so that's fine. The second pivot, however, is a 3, and there is something non-zero above it. So the first step that I'm going to take will be to eliminate the 3 above, just because I don't want to deal with fractions. So I can choose whether to make that 3 into a 1 or to eliminate above it. I choose to eliminate above the 3. And what I get is 1, 2, 0, 4, and then 0, 0, 3, 4. And then the last step in order to make this matrix into the reduced row echelon form is to make sure that the pivots are 1s. The first pivot is a 1, so that's fine. But for the second pivot, I have to divide the second row by three, or rather multiply it by a third. So one third of row two goes into row two. And what we get is one, two, zero, four, zero, zero, one, and then four thirds here. This is the reduced row echelon form of the matrix. And when we have the reduced row echelon form of the matrix, the null space is much easier to see. So 
I can immediately write a basis for the null space of A, which is the same as the null space of U, which is the same as the null space of R. So I need two vectors with four components, right? These are the special solutions. I know I'm going to have um, two vectors with four components because I have four columns. So how will I get so the free the free variables here are x2 and x4. So you get the first solution, the first special solution by setting x2 to equal 1 and x4 to equal 0. So if you do that, you'll get the first solution here. And then the second solution will be obtained by putting x2 to be 0 and x4 to equal 1. So you're asking how do I combine the columns to make, uh, how do I combine the pivot columns uh, to get the uh, to get a zero combination so first of all what is nice in the reduced row echelon form is that every free column is a combination only of the columns of the pivot columns before it so you know that for this column you're not going to be using this one which is kind of obvious so if you set this thing to equal one this zero that zero what you're doing is one plus two, one times x one plus two must be zero, so that tells you that x one better be a negative two. So you see, I get negative two, one, zero, zero. You can quickly check that this vector is in fact orthogonal to the two rows of R and to two rows of U, if you like. That is a confirmation that this vector is in the null space. And then for the other uh, vector, so for x4, we are not going to be using x2. Really, um, it's the 4 and the 4 third that show up. So you will have, you see that this column is 4 times this column plus 4 thirds times that column. So if you do 1 here, you better do a negative 4 there and a negative 4 thirds over here. And that's how you get um, the other special solution. So a negative 4, I'm not using the second column because that's not a pivot column. Then negative 4 thirds and a 1. So those two special solutions uh, solve for us the, the null space. All right, we are done with part A. Now part B. When does Ax equal to B have a solution? Give a basis for the column space of A. So AX equals to B, it, it, what it's asking here is for what B would AX equal to B have a solution? So the first statement is AX equals B has a solution if B is in the column space of A, right? Because A times X represents a linear combination of the columns. So if B is not in the column space, then there is no solution. And then, coincidentally, the second part of the problem says give a basis for the column space of A. So essentially, we are asking for what Bs do we have a solution? Well, we don't know Bs. We don't know the column space of A. We cannot really find the column space by looking at the matrix U. However, remember that when we have AX equals B, AX equals B has a solution when UX equals C has a solution. So at the same time. So if you look at this system and you say, when does UX equal to C have a solution? Well, in U, the last row is zero. In C, the last row better be zero, otherwise I cannot solve ux equals c. So I need this to equal zero. So in other words, ax equal to b has a solution if b is in the column space of a, which is the same as saying that b3 minus b2 plus 4b1 equals zero. So this is what um, defines or how, how our um, column space is sort of given. Now, 
does this give us a basis for the column space of A? No, not quite. How can we find a basis for the column space of A? Um, well, so this is where you kind of have to think maybe a, a step ahead. We already have a basis for the null space of A transpose. And what we know is that the column space is orthogonal to the left null space. So what is, I'll, I'll quickly go to C and then go back to B. So I don't think I'll need a lot more here, but um, let me just say a basis. So this is part C. A basis for the null space of A transpose is so how many vectors in the left null space? The left null space of U is not the same as the null, left null space of A. You have to be very careful here. The column space and left null space of A and U are not the same. However, what is the same is the dimensions. So since the matrix U is of rank two and it has only one row of zeros, that tells you that the dim dimension of the left null space of A is also one. So we're looking only for one vector, and that vector needs to have three components. And in fact, it's given from right here. So the basis that we can find here is, I first write the coefficient before b1, so that's a 4, negative 1 for b2, and a 1 for b3. You see, when I take any vector from the column space of A, I want that vector to be orthogonal to, um, to this vector in the left null space. So you see, if I take a vector b1, b2, b3, and I take the dot product with the vector 4, negative 1, 1, because you see these b's, they're coming from the, null, from the column space. This is a vector b with components b1, b2, b3 that comes from the column space of A. So if I take the dot product, what I get is 4B1 minus B2 plus B3 equals 0. Why does it equal 0? Because that's what we were given right here. If this vector comes from the column space of A, then we know that the third component must be 0. So from here, we see that, um, I mean, this, this just confirms why this vector is in the left null space. So if we're given the left null space, how do we find the column space of A? Right? Because that's what we are asked to do here. We're asked to find a basis for the column space. There's more than one way to do this, but um, I'll give you the column space by finding the orthogonal complement of the left null space. So this part is to be continued after part C. Okay, so now that we have the left null space, we can find the column space. Okay, so remember that the column space of A is orth the orthogonal complement to the left null space. So how can I find the column space? Well, I can simply create a matrix B that has four, negative one, one as a row. And then the null space of this matrix will give me the column space of A, right? Because you see the um, row space of B is the orthogonal complement, or maybe I should say the row space of B is the same as the null space of A transpose. Step number one. The row space, the row space of B has an orthogonal complement, which is the null space of B, and that's the same as the column space. So I'll remove these. I don't want everybody confused, but ultimately the null space of B is going to be the column space of A, okay? So I need to find the null space. Um, 
all I, I, I see that this matrix B is rank one, and therefore there will be two vectors in the column space. The column space will have three components, which is exactly how it needs to be. So I need to find, I, I have two va free variables, x2 and x3, and I can set them to equal one, one at a time. So uh, when x2 is one and x3 is zero, we get one special solution, let's say s1. So I have zero, one, and then I have to worry about what the first number needs to be. Well, that four says it needs to be a quarter because four times a quarter minus one will give us zero. And then when x2 is zero and x3 is one, the special solution is going to be a negative quarter, zero, one. Of course, you could also uh, write this as a quarter and then one, four, zero. And then say, similarly here, a quarter and then negative one, zero, four. So you could take either this vector and this vector, or you could take this vector and this vector. So as long as you find two vectors with three components which are orthogonal to the row here, you have the null space of B. So finally, to summarize my result, uh, the column space of A, which is the same as the null space of the matrix B, uh, or bases of, I'll take one, four, zero, negative one, zero, four. Okay, so that's how we've, and we actually have the four fundamental subspaces of A, by the way. Um, all right, that's all for problem one. The key point is that it's not trivial to go back to A from this vector. I would advise against it. I do advise against go, trying to find the matrix. You would have to find the matrix L such that A equals L times U. And in order to check that this works, you would have to be applying um, L to this matrix to make sure, so applying to, to this vector, if you do L times C should equal B. So if you apply L to this vector and you get the vector with components B1, B2, B3, then you have traced your steps back. But it's not trivial how to trace your steps back from over here. All right, problem number two. Okay, the problem finds the curve C plus two to the power T times D equals B, which gives the best least squares fit to the points, so we're given three points here. You see the zero will be replacing T and the six will be replacing B. So this gives us three equations in two unknowns, C and D are the unknowns. So it says write down the three equations to create this system, AX equals B. This B and this B are not the same. That would be satisfied if the curve went through all three points then write down the equations to solve for the best least square solution, x hat, and it tells you that the unknowns need to be c and d. So how can we set this up? Well, I need to get those equations. So the first equation will be c plus 2 to the power 0 times d equals 6. The second will be c plus 2 to the power 1 times d equals 4. And the third equation will be c plus 2 to the power 2 times d equals 0. Now, from here, the system of equations is 1, 1, 1. This is, these are coefficients for c. 2 to the 0 is 1. 2 to the power 1 is 2. 2 squared is a 4. Times the vector cd equals... 6, 4, 0. During the test number 3, some of you switched the columns here. 
So you wrote 1, 2, 3, and then 1, 1, 1. Obviously not for these equations, but essentially what you did was you switched these two. And therefore, you switched these two. And I just want to point out that that's equally okay, ex except that your solution x hat, uh, x hat uh, will be flipped. Okay, the, the places will be replaced. But ultimately, it would be the same curve. As long as you don't... Um, if you were to go back, as long as you don't uh, call this a C, sorry, this a D, then it's okay, because we need to know exactly what these coefficients represent. Okay, so that's the system. And then it says, then write down the equations to solve for the best square solutions, or ultimately, yeah, I guess just that. And then part B asks you to find the best least square solution and the error E of, of solving with x hat rather than with x. So this over here, I think I want to color. This is the matrix A. This is the vector x. And this is the vector B. So we're given Ax equals B. The equations to find x hat is literally A transpose Ax hat equals a transpose B. You can find those here, or you can find them in part B, it doesn't matter. I think I'll do it in part B. But ultimately, this is what it means to find the equations for the least square solution, or that involve the least square solution. So how to find the best x hat? Easiest thing is to first calculate A transpose A. So calculate this part, and calculate this part. This will give you, uh, so this will be uh, a vector with two components. This will be a matrix that is two by two, and we can solve the problem. So A transpose A equals one, 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 two, four times one, 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 two, four. This matrix will be invertible, invertible because the columns of A are linearly independent. Here we have three, then one plus two plus four is a seven, a seven here as well, and one plus four plus 16. So one plus four plus 16, that's a 21 right here. Oh, I guess I was wrong. This is, why are these not linearly independent? Oh, they are. I was thinking 3 times 7 is 21, but they are not a linearly dependent. Okay, so we have the matrix A transpose A. Now let's find A transpose B. This is 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 4 times the vector B, which has component 6, 4, 0 equals... 6 plus 4 is 10, then we have 6 plus 8, which is 14. And now we have to solve this system. 3, 7, 7, 21 times C hat D hat equals 10, 14. I don't like these numbers for any reductions or even finding inverses. I would much rather use Kramer's rule. So that's what I'll do. I'll do C hat equals, in the denominator, I will have 10, 14, oh, sorry, that's um, the determinant of A, A transpose B, A transpose A really, but anyway, 3, 7, 7, 21. And then in the numerator, I have 10, 14, 7, 21. So what do we have? We have 210 here minus, and it might be smart to factor some stuff out, really. Yeah, I think I don't want to deal with big numbers. I always hated big numbers. I'm not great at computations. So here's some things I can do. From the first column, I can factor out a 2. From the second column, I can factor out a 7. So 7 is a common multiple here. And 2 is a common multiple there. So 2 times 7 is 14 times this matrix. Oh, that would be a 5. 
and a seven and then one and three i like these small numbers better and i cannot do the same in the denominator but that's okay i can factor out a seven from the second column so i have seven and then three seven one three i just like working with smaller numbers more uh, by the way 14 divided by 7 is a 2 so i can just cancel that and have a 2 here so then on top i have 2 times 15 minus 7 so that's an 8 and then in the denominator i have 9 minus 7 which is a 2 and that turned out to be an 8 i like these numbers more and then let's do d hat so um you see that the the determinant here because i'm going to need it for the other one so i, I want to make a few comments is 2 times 7 so this is 14. so now d hat is 3 7 10 14 over 14. I can factor out 7 from the second row and then a 2 from the second column. So actually, I know so uh, 7 is a common multiple here, 2 is a common multiple there, so I can factor from each, and then I'll have 14 times 3, 5, one one okay and that should be a determinant over 14 those two cancel out nicely and we have three minus five which is a negative two of course you can use calculators if you like that is fine so this is x hat and maybe i'll write it somewhere maybe even on the next page. So x hat equals, I know this was a negative two, the other one was how much? Eight. So we found x hat. And now we have to find the error e. So what is e? I see this is a little too big. So, E equals the vector B minus the projection P using the projection of B onto the column space of A rather than B. So I need to find what P is. P is A times X hat. So I just need to multiply A times X hat. The matrix A was 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 4 times X hat that's 8, negative 2. We're going to get a vector with three components. So that's 8 minus 2, which is a 6. 8 minus 4, which is a 4. And then 8 minus 8, which is a 0. So what do you see here? This is actually the vector B. So E is B minus P, which is B minus B, which is 0. What does this tell you? What it tells you is that B was already in the column space of A. So B was already in the column space of A. So we actually didn't have to use least squares, but that's okay. And in fact, you can easily, I mean, this tells you exactly how to combine the columns of A uh, to get the vector B. All right. But of course, the, the solution is general. You could have a different kind of B so that B minus B is not the zero vector. Next problem. Suppose V is any unit vector in R3. So what does this mean? It means that V has three components because it's in R3. And it means that its length is one. So to summarize, the assumptions of the problem, V is something like this. It has V1, V2, V3, three components, and the length of V is one. So in fact, the square is also one, which means 
v1 squared plus v2 squared plus v3 squared is 1. Now this question is about the matrix H given by 2 v v transpose minus the identity. You could try to see this as a matrix. So what is v times v transpose, for example? And you can do that for this general v if you are confused with working with a formula. So you have v1, v2, v3. This is a rank 1 matrix. And then v1, v2, v3 minus the identity. So that just means you're going to be subtracting a 1 along the diagonal. So let's see what that matrix is. Now, rank 1 matrix means you have this vector multiplied by v1 in the first column, this vector multiplied by v2 in the second column, and this vector multiplied by v3 in the third column. As convention, I will always write smaller index followed by a bigger index. So if I do v3 times v2, I'm going to write it as v2 times v3, because that way I can see the symmetry. So I have v1 squared, then I have v1, v2, then I have v1, v3, then I have v1, v2, v2 squared, v1, v3, v1, v3, v2, v3, v3 squared. So you see that this matrix is symmetric as it should be, minus the identity. So finally, this matrix H, if I want to see it in general terms, which I'm not saying necessarily that I do want to, but I know some of you want to see the matrix, is going to be 2v1 squared minus 1. Then we have 2v1v2, 2v1v3. V2. V1, V3. Then we have 2v1v2, 2v2 squared minus 1. 2v1, v3. Oh, no, that's a mistake. That should be v2. Uh, yeah, that's a v2, v3. Yes, that should be v2, v3. The rest is good. Then 2v1, v3, 2v2, v3, and 2v3 squared minus 1. So this is the matrix H, okay? In general terms, the only thing you have to add to this vector is that V1 squared plus V2 squared plus V3 squared equals 1. Now, I'm not saying I will be using the actual matrix. I think I'll stick with the formula. But sometimes we want to see this. Okay, now part A says multiply H times H to show that H squared is the identity. Two ways to do it. So one way is take this matrix and square it. It's not going to be very pretty. I would rather square this expression. But if you're confused with how to square matrices that are written in this way, then you can always go to the actual matrix with components. So I want to find or show that h squared is the identity. Identity, not one. So this is the part that we need to show. So if I take my matrix H, which is 2V, V transpose minus the identity, then what is H squared? So I'll take my time. This is 2V, V transpose minus I times 2V, V transpose minus I. And now this is just like in calculus, except that you have to pay attention to the order. On the other hand, multiplying by the identity, you have commutation. So it doesn't matter because you have a matrix minus the identity multiplied by the same matrix minus the identity. So you have this times this. The 2 and the 2, these are constants, so you get a 4. But then you have to follow the order. You can't write VV transpose squared. I mean, you can, but you shouldn't. You should write V, V transpose, V, V transpose. Then you have this times the identity with a minus. Anything times the identity, so that matrix times the identity, you just get the matrix 2VV transpose. Then you have minus identity times 2VV transpose, so that's another 2VV transpose. 
And then you have minus identity times minus identity. Well, that is identity squared, but the identity squared is just the identity. So you don't have to write the square because when you square the identity matrix, you get the identity itself. So how can this be equal to the identity matrix? Well, obviously this part is negative for VV transpose, whereas here you look at V transpose V, by the way, uh, this expression is exactly V transpose V. So I can say here V transpose V is one, or here V transpose V is one. So that's very nice. That's the uh, length is one in vector form. So you see that this is just one. So ultimately what we have, what this simplifies to is four VV transpose minus four VV transpose plus the identity. Well, clearly those two cancel each other out and we're left with the identity matrix, which is what we were asked to show. Okay, show that H passes the tests for being a symmetric matrix and an orthogonal matrix. All right, so how to show that, uh, that H is a symmetric matrix? So we need to show two things. We need to show that H transpose equals H, and this is symmetry, and that H transpose times H is the identity. Now note that if we show this, if we know that this is true, then combine that with H squared, you could write H squared would be the same as H transpose H, and we've already shown that that's the identity. So the second part follows directly from part A and the first part. It's the first part that's truly interesting. So again, we have to look at the definition of H, which is 2VV transpose minus the identity. From here, I need to look at H transpose. So I have this expression, and I need to transpose it. This is where we need to remember the rules for transposition. So inside the parentheses, we have a difference. So we have one matrix minus another matrix transposed. Well, that is the first matrix transposed minus the second matrix transposed. So that's the first part. We have two VV transpose transpose minus identity transposed. How do we apply the transpose on this part. The two is a number, so the two can come out no problem. And then you have one matrix times another matrix transposed. The answer is this transposed times this transpose. You have to reverse the order. So we get two times V transpose transpose times V transpose minus the identity is a diagonal matrix, so it matches its transpose. So that's just the identity. The only question now is, what is the transpose of the transpose? Well, the transpose of the transpose is V itself. So really, here we have 2V V transpose minus I, and you see that this matches H exactly. So we have shown that H transpose equals H, which in other words means that H is symmetric. Now, to show that H is orthogonal, we need to check that H transpose H is the identity. But since H transpose is the same as H, I can write this as H times H, which is H squared, which we showed that is the, is the identity by part A. So that's it with part B. Now part C, find the eigenvalues of the identity. Now, this is really interesting because you're not seeing the matrix H. In fact, you understand that there are infinitely many matrices H that are um, symmetric and orthogonal and of this form. You take any vector in R3, which is unit vector, or take any vector, normalize it. So you get the vector that is in the same direction but of unit length, and you get yourself a symmetric orthogonal matrix. So then how do we find the 
eigenvalues of the matrix. This is the truly interesting part. Okay, I think we need a new page. So H is 2V V transpose minus the identity. And we want to find the eigenvalues. Now, pay attention to the fact that this matrix, okay, let me call this matrix over here something else. Maybe I can call it, I don't know, uh, M, for example. So let M equal VV transpose. So just to isolate, um, that uh, rank one matrix so that h equals 2m minus i why am i doing this the reason is that if i can find the eigenvalues of m then i have the eigenvalues of h so if lambda is an eigenvalue of m, then 2 lambda minus 1 is an eigenvalue of h. Let's see why that is so. So what does it mean for lambda to be an eigenvalue of m? It means that there is some vector x such that mx equals lambda x. Okay, now let me take that same vector and do h times x. So if this, then h times x equals 2m minus i times x, which is 2mx minus i times x. Now m times x is lambda x, so I have 2 lambda x, and i times x is simply x. Now x can be factored out, and we have 2 lambda minus 1, times x. So you see that if lambda is an eigenvalue of m, and you have this relationship between h and m, then this linear, so eigenvalues are somehow linear. We have a scaling of m, and then we have a shift by the identity. So ultimately, really what we need is to find the eigenvalues of m. So we need to find the eigen values of m. Okay. Now m is v v transpose, which is a rank one matrix. Why is rank one important? Because if the rank is one, then that means only one eigen value is non-zero. So M has only one non-zero eigenvalue, and the rest are zeros. Well, how many eigenvalues does M have to begin with? M is a three by three matrix, so M has three eigenvalues. Two of them are zero. How do I get the last one? So I have lambda one is not zero, lambda two is zero, lambda three is zero, and that's it. And now if I only have an equation that connects the eigenvalues together so I don't actually have to solve determinants, that would be great. It turns out we do have the perfect equation, and that is the trace. The trace of m equals lambda 1 plus lambda 2 plus lambda 3. And since these two are zeros, it equals lambda 1. So all I need is the trace of m. Okay, what's the trace of m? Let's go back here. This matrix is the matrix m. What is its trace? The trace is the sum of diagonal terms. 
v1 squared plus v2 squared plus v3 squared, which happens to be equal to 1. So we have the trace of m equals v1 squared plus v2 squared plus v3 squared, which is 1. So the eigenvalues of m are lambda 1 equal 1, lambda 2 equals 0, lambda 3 equals 0, whereas the eigenvalues of h are given by 2 lambda minus 1, so 2 times 1 minus 1, uh, maybe I'll call them mu 1, 2 minus 1 is a 1, then mu 2 will be negative 1, and mu3 will be negative 1. You can try this, if you don't believe it, on any, like just literally take any vector v that is length 1 and check that you indeed get these results. So the claim here is in general for any matrix H of that form, you will get these um, eigenvalues, these properties. So these are very useful matrices. All right, next problem. The problem is to find the determinants of A, B, and C. So for part A, find the determinant of A and give a reason. Why do I want this give a reason? Because I don't really have to solve determinants for part A. The determinant of A is 0 because row 1 equals row 2. So when you have a linearly dependent rows or multiples of each other or equal rows, the determinant is 0. That tells you that A is non-invertible. Now, part B says find the cofactor 1, 1 and then find the determinant B. So why do I want to do that? Well, and, and why, how, how does it say use linearity in row 1? Well, I need to look at these, these matrices. They do look very similar. In A and in B, everything is the same except for that number. Right? So how can I use this cofactor? Or maybe, maybe let's start there. What is the cofactor C11? So C11 is negative 1 to the power 1 plus 1 times the determinant that we get when we remove the first column and the first row of B. So it's a 3 by 3 matrix that has 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0. It's clearly not 0 here. This matrix is invertible. Um, how can I get it? Well, if I just switch row 1 and row 3, I'm going to get a lower triangular matrix, and I'm good to go. So um, this part is 1. I have minus 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. What did I do here? I switched row 1 and row 2, which changed the sign of the determinant. And now this matrix has determinant 1 times that negative. We have a negative 1. So, the, so C11 is negative 1. Now, how do I use linearity? How could, of course, you can find determinant of B in other ways. In fact, if you used reduction, you wouldn't need C11 at all. However, if you look at um, the matrix A, or the determinant of A, so you have 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0. Linearity in the first row means that I can write this as the sum of two determinants whose first rows add up. So the second, third, and fourth rows, they need to stay the same. So here's what I'll do, just because I can. There. 
And one more time. I guess that looks fine. So I also, I kind of don't like this. There we go. Just want them to look a little bit more similar. Okay, so we have the three rows. Now, I whatever rows I write, I want them when they add up to give me A. Well, obviously I can do 0, 1, 1, 1, then I would need to do 1, 0, 0, 0. So what do I have here? Well, this is the determinant of A. This is the determinant of B. Question is, what is this other matrix? Or the determinant of this other matrix? Well, let me do expansion by the first row. Expansion by the first row gives me exactly C11. So you see, the determinant of this matrix is exactly C11. If you do expansion along the first row, you will have 1 times, you remove this row and that column, so you have that lower determinant, which is exactly what C11 is. So the determinant of A is 0 equals negative 1 plus the determinant of B. Therefore, the determinant of B better be a 1. Of course, you don't have to use this trick. You could just as well do elimination. You will have to do a row exchange. You could do expansion, various uh, ways to solve the problem, and all equally valid. Then it says, find the determinant of C for any value of X. You could use linearity in row 1. Now, how would you change this to fit the matrix C? Obviously, you would write an X here. So when we go to part C, um, I will write here the determinant of the matrix C. So we have X, 1, 1, 1. 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0. It equals the determinant of the matrix X, 0, 0, 0. And then I have to keep the, the remaining rows the same because I only have linearity in one row at a time. And then 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0. So um, here I have the determinant of the matrix C. Here I have the determinant of B, which is 1. So that right-hand side is nice. And to solve this inner part, um, this really is x times C11 one, one, because... Um, if you do expansion along the first row, you have x times the determinant of this minor, because this is in position 1, 1, it's with a plus. And then if you continued here, you would have 0 times something, 0, 0. So it, really the first component is the only thing that matters. And so here we have the determinant of c is x times c1, 1 plus the determinant of B. Let me write that here. So C11, we saw here, equals a negative 1. So we have minus x plus 1. So the determinant of C is 1 minus x. You could, of course, solve this using... Um, row reduction, elimination, or um, expansion, if you like, so multiple ways of doing the same. Of course, if you want to do elimination on this matrix, I suggest switching these two rows so that you can be eliminating with a 1 rather than an X, then, um, then carrying out elimination, you should get to the same answer. Problem number five. So we have the matrix A, which is nice and symmetric. And we are told, observe that A is symmetric, singular, 
and one third of A is a Markov matrix. So what does that mean for us? Well, it means that if we add all the terms in each column, we're going to get threes everywhere, which is indeed the case. Uh, the symmetry tells us that A will have enough eigenvectors, that its eigenvalues are going to be real numbers. Singularity tells us that one eigenvalue of A is a zero. One third A is a Markov matrix says that one third of A has an eigenvalue, has one eigenvalue equal to one, which tells you that A has an one eigenvalue equal to a three. You can double check that one of the eigenvalues will equal a three. So if you know that one eigenvalue is a zero and another eigenvalue is a three, then you can find the last eigenvalue by using the trace. So we have quite a bit of information here. So um, A singular implies A has a zero eigenvalue. So let's say lambda one is zero. Then one third of A Markov tells us that one third of A has an eigenvalue one. For A, that means A has an eigenvalue three, that is lambda two is a three. And then since the trace of A must equal lambda one plus lambda two plus lambda three, we can find the third eigenvalue. The trace of A is one plus two plus two, so that's a five, equals zero plus three plus lambda three. So from here, we see that the third eigenvalue is a two. So we have this and this. Um, before I continue, I want to take you on a short detour to explain why this is the case. So I've shown a, so a short detour here, okay? I've shown that if A is a Markov matrix, that lambda equal to one is an eigenvalue. But here the key is this. If lambda is an eigenvalue of A, then what happens, then what do we know? We know that there is some x such that a times x equals lambda x. So what happens then to um, one, third, one third a? So one third a multiplied by x is the same as one third ax. And ax equals lambda x, so we have one third lambda x here. So what do we see? We see that if lambda is an eigenvalue of a, then one third of a uh, of lambda is an eigenvalue of one third of a. So lambda, an eigenvalue of a, then one third lambda is an eigen value of one third a. Now, over here in this example, in our example, we know not the eigenvalue of a, but we know the eigenvalue of one third a. So similarly here in this detour, I can say uh, that three lambda is an eigenvalue of three a. Okay, 
So what, however I multiply the matrix, that's how I multiply eigenvalues for, with the same eigenvectors, right? The same x's will do the trick. So if I know that 1 is an eigenvalue of 1 third a, it means that the eigenvalue of a had to be a 3 because a third times 3 gives me 1. You can, of course, calculate this. The, the idea is you will have uh, this matrix 1 minus lambda, 1, 1, 1, 2 minus lambda, 0, 1, 0, 2 minus lambda. Now pay attention. If you add up all the rows into the first row, you're going to get 3 minus lambda, 3 minus lambda, 3 minus lambda. That factors out. So that 3 minus lambda fact factor times something else equals 0 tells you that lambda equal to 3 is one of the solutions. This is just us not having to go through finding determinants. So we were able to find the eigenvalues uh, by using this property that the trace of the eigenvalues, uh, is, sorry, the trace of the matrix is the sum of the eigenvalues. The fact that all the columns added up to the same number. So you don't even have to have a Markov matrix. You could even have the columns adding up to a negative 5. So that cannot possibly come from a Markov matrix. I mean, it could because then you would have uh, minus 1 fifth of A is Markov. So that tells you multiply. Well, this had to be a negative 5, had to have an eigenvalue negative 5 so that this whole thing could have an eigenvalue equal to 1. Um, and it comes from that same trick. Okay, we found the eigenvalues. I'm done with the detour. I'm not writing anything else. I want to find the eigenvectors of A, and for that I'm going to need the matrix. So here's my matrix A again. 1, 1, 1. Uh, 1, 2, 0. 1, 0, 2. And the three eigenvalues that we found were lambda 1 equal to 0, lambda 2 equal to 3, and lambda 3 equal to a 2. So lambda 1 equal to 0, how do we find the corresponding eigenvector? Um, well, the eigenvector has to come from the null space of A. So lambda 1 equals 0, eigenvector in null space of A. So can I quickly find the null space of A? Well, I see here, you can do this by observation, right? So I'm going to call that vector x1, and it's going to have three components. I can, I, I can carry out elimination. That's one way to do this. Another way is to simply make an observation here. So I know that this is... Um, that, the, that this matrix has only two pivots, so the third column is a combination of the previous two. And pay attention, if you add the second and the third column, what you will get is 2, 2, 2. So then if you do minus 2 times the first row, plus the second, plus the third, or sorry, not row, but column, you're going to get 0. So check that negative 2, 1, 1 is indeed orthogonal to every row of A. The first one, definitely. The second and the third. So it's orthogonal. So this is really the eigenvector, one eigenvector corresponding to lambda 1 being equal to 0. So negative 2, 1, 1. Um, do try to use observation. If you can just see a vector that is orthogonal to all three rows, then you have found your null space, and you know that you're only looking for one um, vector. The other way, I repeat, would be, maybe I'll, I'll show you just for this, again, as a little detour, how to do this the long way, and then I'll remove it from the solutions. So the long way would be you take your matrix and you reduce. So this is the pivot I'm reducing underneath. I'm doing R2 minus R1 into R2, R3 minus R1 into R3, 
we will get 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, negative 1, 0, negative 1, 1. Then we eliminate with this one below and above. I'll do it this time. Row 1 minus row 2 into row 1. Row 3 plus row 2 into row 3. We get 1, 0, negative 2, 0, 1, negative 1, 0, 0, 0. So you see the two pivots. And now the question is, how do you make uh, the last column? Well, how do you get the last column? You get it by doing negative 2 of the first column minus... Mm, Row two. I feel like I have a mistake here somewhere. Hmm. Where did I make a mistake? One. Why would it be? Maybe this is a two. Is this a two? So this minus that, yes, that's a 2 because we would have 1 minus minus 1, which is plus. Okay, so that needs to be a positive 2. And you see here, uh, 2 and negative 1 are exactly where these two came from. You just have to flip the signs. So if you want this to add up to 0, you better multiply that 1 by a negative 2. To make this add up to 0, it's all good, 1 and then this is 1. So you're setting up the free term, the free variable to equal 1, and then you find the values for x1 and x2. You're exactly going to get that special solution. So you can find the null space of this matrix or the null space of that matrix. You get the same, um, I, you get the same null space. You get the same eigenvector. So that's another way to uh, find these things if you can't simply see the solution by observation. All right, now what about lambda 2 equal to 3? So this is the second eigenvalue. I'm going to switch to um, blue. So eigenvector is now in the null space of a minus 3 times the identity. So what is a minus 3 times i? I have to subtract a 3 along the diagonal, so I'm going to have negative 2, 1, 1, 1, negative 1, 0, 1, 0, negative 1. And I know that I have the null space here. So how do I get the null space? Well, actually, it's quite easy. If you add all the rows or all the columns, um, you need to add the columns, even though this is symmetric. But if you add all the columns, you're simply going to get 0. See here, negative 2 plus 1 plus 1, 0. 1 minus 1, 0. 1 minus 1, 0. So the null space is defined by the vector 1, 1, 1. This is like very obvious. And in fact, that's always an eigenvector of a Markov matrix because the rows add up to 1. So the special solution is the vector 1, 1, 1. And now for lambda 3 equal to a 2, I subtract a 2 along the diagonal. So now um, the eigenvector is in the null space of a minus 2 times the identity. So a minus 2i equals negative 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0. 1, 0, 0. You see here that this is obviously um, singular, right? This is the only pivot. Everything else is a 0. So now we just ask um, for a vector that... Is this how this turns out? Yeah, we subtract it too. We get the zeros. Yeah, so actually, um, we have two pivots here. We have two columns that are linearly independent. You see that these two columns are not multiples of each other. 
So those would be pivots. It's just that you don't see the pivots without having uh, conducted um, elimination. So when you eliminate uh, the ones here, you're going to produce non-zero here and here and then here and here, but these zeros and these zeros will be the same. So ultimately there will be a pivot in this position. So how can you find the null space without carrying out the elimination? Well, you're looking for a way to combine the columns of this matrix to get zero. Since this column and this column are exactly the same, if I just do negative one here and one there, and of course don't include the first column, then I'm going to get a combination that gives me zero. So I see that my special solution x3 equals zero, negative one, one you can check that this vector is indeed orthogonal to every row of a minus 2i. If you can't see it, carry out the elimination just the way we did it here, and then find your solutions from the reduced row echelon form. A quick check to make sure that we don't have this wrong is to check that these eigenvectors are mutually orthogonal, and the reason for that is that your matrix A is symmetric. So whenever you have a symmetric matrix, the eigenvectors that come from different eigenvalues are mutually orthogonal. So taking a dot product with this vector literally asks if um, the sum of terms is zero. For this vector, the answer is yes. For this vector, the answer is yes. So now we just have to check if these two vectors are orthogonal. If you quickly take the dot product, you see that you get zero again. So this, these are the three eigenvectors for the matrix A. Then it says calculate u infinity if u k equals this, and this is your vector u zero. So you have a u naught, and it, and there are some instructions. It says begin by expressing u naught as a linear combination of the vectors of a. So let's follow those instructions and see what happens. So we have part c, u naught equals 1, 0, 0, whereas the three vectors, I'll just write them here, These are the eigenvectors, 0, negative 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, and the first one was negative 2, 1, 1. Okay, so how do we combine things to get 0? Okay, so let me write... I, a systematic way to do this, so first let me describe a systematic way. So like a procedure, an algorithm that will always work no matter the situation. You're looking for C1, C2, C3 such that this matrix of eigenvectors, so if you have negative 2, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 0, negative 1, 1 times c1, c2, c3 equals 1, 0, 0. This is what we're trying to solve. So you set it up like this, and you can actually solve this using um, Kramer's rule, if you like. So systematic way is to find c1, c2, c3, such that, well, to solve this system, right? Uh, what they say, what these c's are saying is that c1, x1 plus c2, x2 plus c3, x3 equals u0. That's what those c's are doing. Um, what do I want to do here? Well, I kind of want to figure out what C1 and C2 need to be. If I do 3 and a 1. Hmm. You know what? Let's use Kramer's rule. 
I can probably come up with a solution without using Kramer's rule, but I like Kramer's rule because I have a negative two in that pivot position and I don't like that. So according to Kramer's, um, so using Kramer's rule, we have C1 equals, maybe I need to first find a determinant of, or this is the matrix X. So let's find a determinant of X. And I will do perhaps a quick expansion along the first row. So I have negative two times the matrix one, negative one, 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 minus one times the matrix one, one, negative one, one. So that's nice because I got the same thing. So I have one times, or sorry, negative one minus uh, one, that's negative three times one. So this determinant is one minus negative one. So that's a two which comes here, so I have negative six. So that's nice. So C1 is determinant one, zero, zero, one, 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 zero, negative one, one, over negative six. I will do expansion along the first column, so removing this and this times one. So this is simply, again, that matrix 1, 1, negative 1, 1 over negative 6, and the determinant of that matrix in the numerator is a 2, so I have 2 over negative 6, which is negative 1 third. C2 equals, now I will put 1, 0, 0 as the second column, negative 2, 1, 1, 0, negative one, one. What I'll do is I'll do expansion along the second column. Now the one corresponds to a negative spot. So I have minus one, one, negative one, one over negative six. So on top I have negative two, so this is a third. And then C3 equals negative one over six times this determinant. So I'll put one zero zero in the third uh, column. And I will do expansion along the last column. So I have negative one six times. Um, so this comes with a plus sign because remember we have plus minus plus. So that's where that minus came from because this comes with a minus sign. Um, and the determinant in question is going to be 1, 1, 1, 1, which is just 0, so we get 0. So we found C1 to equal negative 1 third, C2 positive 1 third, and C3 to be a 0. Now, I actually need a new page. So I have uh, my vector u0 equals negative one third x one plus one third x two and nothing from x three. We can double check that this is really so. So essentially if we do minus x one plus x two and then divide that sum by three, we will be able to check that we have this correct. So minus x one plus x two equals 2 plus 1, minus 1 plus 1, minus 1 plus 1. That's definitely 3, 0, 0. So if we divide everything by 3, we're going to get 1, 0, 0. So that's definitely correct. And now let's go back to the problem. Now we need to look at what is UK. So u sub k is one third of a to the power k u zero. Okay, so let me write that. u sub k equals one third of a to the power k 
times u naught. Okay, how do I apply this k to the one third a? Well, it's simply one third to the power k times a to the power k u naught. So then what is, the question is, what is a k times u naught? We don't know. But what is very easy is to apply any power of a onto the eigenvectors of a. So this is where this um, u naught expression comes into play. So we have one third to the power k times a k to the power to the vector negative one third x one plus one third x two. Okay. So what we get is. By the way, we can factor this one-third and this one-third out, and we would have one-third to the power of k plus 1. So we have one-third to the power of k plus 1 times minus a to the k x1 plus a to the k x2. So this is what we have. So now a to the k times x1, if you recall, lambda 1 is 0 and lambda 2 is a 3. So um, a to the k, what we get is 1 third to the k plus 1 times negative lambda 1 to the k times x1 plus lambda 2 to the k x2. That's exactly... Uh, the way we apply a to the power k to an eigenvector is literally replacing a with a with the corresponding eigenvalue lambda. Now lambda one is just zero; that's just what it is. Whereas lambda two, this equals three. So what we end up having here is one third to the power of k plus one times 3 to the k times x2. So now the question is, what is this? I know many of you don't like calculus, but this really is just one third. How do you get? So I'll write the answer. And you see that, in fact, the k doesn't matter. For any k, we have that u sub k equals one third of x2. So you have this, uh, this x2 doesn't change. No matter how many times you apply a to it, it doesn't change because it's actually one third a that we're applying to it. So that one third is very important. Otherwise things would explode. So u infinity is one third of x2 which you can replace with numbers or leave as is. Um, a small detour to explain this part. So this is kind of pre-calculus stuff. So 1 third to the power of k plus 1 times 3 to the k. The first part, you can put that k plus 1 simply to the denominator because 1 third to the k plus 1 is 1 to the k plus 1, over 3 to the k plus 1. And maybe I'll just write that. So the rules for fraction being uh, set to an exponent is that the exponent is applied to both numerator and denominator. 1 to any power is simply 1. Now what is 3 to the power of k plus 1? Um, so you can think of 3 to the k plus 1 as 3 to the k times 3. So I can replace here 1 in the numerator, 3 times 3 to the k in the denominator times 3 to the k. Now this number and this number, they're the same. Whatever they are, they're the same. So I can simply cancel them out. If you can't do these reductions, it's not the end of the world. If you come kind of all the way up to here and replacing, uh, well, actually, I need to see this equation. Whether you factored the third out or not is irrelevant. You can put a to the k right here and a to the k right here. I just want to see what is a to the k times x1 and what is a to the k times x2. So once I see that, then 
I can, uh, then it doesn't really matter that much how much you can uh, simplify this, this part. But I hope, actually, it's not going to be more complicated than what I've shown you here. So if you get something similar, you can always refer to this example. I'll just double check that we calculated everything. Yeah, so you see, um, for this u naught, we do have something like u infinity. No matter how many times we apply this change to the initial vector, um, we're going to stop with one third of it. And that's it. Well, sorry, one third of x1, where x1 is, or x2, one third of x2. So we're always going to have a third, a third, a third. All right, this vector over here is simply one third, one third, one third. All right, next problem. Suppose the singular value decomposition A has these u sigma and v given. Find the eigenvalues of A transpose A. Um, before I solve this problem, I want to say I'm not giving you a lot of uh, singular value decomposition examples here, but I did solve a few um, in the last video. I do need you to know those examples. It's very important you should expect to see a question that asks you to compute the singular value decomposition for a matrix A. It's also important that you're able to use the singular value decomposition of a matrix A, a given singular value, uh, to conclude certain things about the matrix like we have here. So the eigenvalues of A transpose A. We know that they come, actually I saw this as one of the examples, we know that they come from one and four or rather that the singular values of A come from the, I, they are square roots of the eigenvalues of A transpose A. So you know that one squared and four squared are eigenvalues. Question is, how many eigenvalues does A transpose A have? To answer that question, you have to see what is the size of A transpose A. To talk about that, first question is, what is the size of A? The size of A is the same as the size of sigma. So sigma always tells you the size of A. So for part A here, size of A is 3 by 4. So you see that um, there are at least three eigenvalues, possibly four, depending on the sizes. So then size of A transpose A if A is 3 by 4, then A transpose A is 4 by 3. Then 3 by 4, you see that that's 4 by 4. So this tells you that A transpose A has four eigenvalues. The number of non-zero eigenvalues is the same as the number of singular values of A. So now the eigenvalues of A transpose A are lambda 1 equal to 1 squared, lambda 2 equal to 4 squared, lambda 3 equal to 0, lambda 4 equal to 0. So I needed to know how many lambdas are in A transpose A, but I already knew two of them from looking at the singular value decomposition or looking at sigma, looking at the non-zero values in sigma. Okay, find a basis for the null space of A. So we've already talked about this. I know I've, I've talked about this in, um, in the previous videos. But look at sigma. Sigma is rank 2. Okay, so you know that uh, the dimension of the null space of sigma is 2. So there are two free columns in sigma. A also has two free columns. The columns... The column space, sorry, the null space of sigma has four components, okay? If you remember that the null space is either columns in U or columns in V, you're on a very good track. Well, since the null space of sigma has to have four components, then two vectors in here give me the null space. Which two vectors? You count two from the end, right? So by knowing that the dimension is 2 and that there need to be 4 
components in the null space, you know that these two vectors give you the null space of A. So a basis for the null space of A, you could divide them by a half, but you don't have to. You can just say 1, 1, negative 1, negative 1, and then 1, negative 1, negative 1, 1. Of course, you could compute the matrix A, but there is just no need. Okay. Find a basis for the column space of A. So again, you want to ask yourself how many columns to expect. Since A is of rank 2, the column space has dimension 2. Okay, so we have two vectors. Are those vectors in R3 or are they, are they in R4? So that's the next question we have to answer. Well, I see that this, the columns of sigma have three components and A looks like sigma, so I'm looking for vectors with three components. Well, they better be in U. And remember, column space and row space count from the beginning. So those are the important things. Column space, row space. And the rest are the orthogonal complements because these matrices are orthogonal matrices. So we have a basis for the column space of A. It's negative 1, 2, 2. We actually have an orthogonal basis, uh, positive 2 here, negative 1, 2. If I want to make, make it an orthonormal basis, I will just divide this vector by 3. And now part D. Find a singular value decomposition of negative A transpose, that is, give matrices U1, sigma 1, V1, such that negative A transpose is U1, sigma 1, V1 transpose. Obviously, I'm going to be using these U, sigma V somehow, right? So if my matrix A is U, sigma V transpose, although if you note, this matrix V is symmetric, so actually, in this particular case, I can replace, um, I can omit the transpose. I have u sigma v if I want. Then minus a is going to be minus u sigma v. Now remember, the singular values of a always have to be positive. So I cannot put that minus with sigma. I can give it to u or I can give it to V, but I cannot give it to sigma. And then I need to transpose. So let's transpose. So when I transpose, I reverse the order in which I transpose. I have V transpose, sigma transpose, and then negative U transpose. V transpose is V again. Sigma transpose is sigma transpose. Um, sigma is a diagonal matrix, however, it's 3 by 4, so when you transpose it, what happens is that these zeros over here will come as, as zeros over here. The square part will stay the same, but this column will shift into a row. And then uh, you transpose, well, I need, I need to find um, the singular value composition of a transpose to be of u sigma v transpose type. So I'm just going to leave it like that, even though uh, u is also symmetric and negative u would therefore also be symmetric. So now all I need to do is I need to identify here what is u1, what is sigma1, and what is v1. So I can say u1 equals v sigma1 equals sigma transpose, and v1 equals negative u. The only thing, the only freedom that you have here in how you choose your u1, sigma1, v1, is whether you give the minus to u or you give it to v. So you could have here uh, u for v1, negative v for u1, and this would also give you a singular value decomposition for negative a transpose. The only key is that your sigma cannot have negative values. So you cannot say 
sigma 1 equals minus sigma transpose. That would be wrong. Your sigma must have positive values. Okay, this was a very easy question, obviously. Now, this problem is not new. You had this for the third exam. And the reason I'm bringing it here, although I've published solutions, is because I think you need uh, to hear the way in which you should be thinking about problems like these. So what am I doing here? I'm trying to test whether you understand the fundamental theorem of linear algebra and how to use it. So let me remind you about the fundamental theorem of linear algebra. You have a matrix A, right? So we have a matrix A, which is M by N, right? So we have two spaces here. We have R N and we have R M. A is a map from Rn to Rm. In Rn, we have a space which is given by the rows of A. So A has M rows, but each row has N components. So this is the row space of A. We know that the row space of A has an orthogonal complement which happens to be the null space of A. So these two spaces are orthogonal, which means that if you take a vector in Rn, any vector in Rn will split into a part in the row space. So if this is xr and that's xn, they will create an x in Rn that splits exactly as a sum. Okay, so this x splits into a sum xr plus xn such that xr transpose xn is zero. So those two parts are orthogonal. And the matrix A maps this space into another space, into, uh, well, subspaces of Rm, the first one being the column space of A. So the entire row space gets mapped into the column space and the column space, the null space of A gets mapped into zero. So what I have here is the zero vector and same on the left-hand side. And then here we have another subspace, which is the orthogonal complement. And that is the left null space of A. So very important thing. And every vector in Rm also splits into a sum, a part, so every B, if you like, this would be a B, splits into a projection P and an error term. So this P is A times X hat, the least square solution. So this is how things get mapped um, by using A. This is the fundamental theorem of linear algebra. The key is that the dimension of the row space of A is the same as the dimension of the column space of A which is the rank of the matrix. And the rest, the null space and the left null space, have the appropriate dimensions to get to n and m, respectively. What is the key observation? The key observation is that if I have some vectors from Rn as the rows of a matrix A, then I can find the null space to find this other space. There is another matrix, say B, which has a basis for the null space of A as its rows. So if I take three vectors from here, for example, put them as the rows of some matrix B, then the null space of B will be the row space of A. So I can put vectors from here in the rows of a matrix, or I can take vectors from here, put them in the rows of a matrix, and then find the null space, which 
always just finds me the orthogonal complement of the rows of the matrix. So the point here is to play. If I have this, how do I find that? If I have this, how do I find that? And vice versa. So I can give you, to give you two subspaces of A that can define all subspaces, all four subspaces of A, then I have to give you one from this group and one from this group. If I give you the column space, you already have the left null space. If I give you the left null space, you have the column space. So no point in giving you both of these. If I give you the row space, you have the null space and vice versa. So you can practice. There aren't that many combinations. I can give you row space and column space, row space and left null space, left uh, null space and column space, null space and left null space. Those are the four possibilities that give you the same information at the end of the day because you can extract the rest. So what have I given you here? I've given you a basis for the null space and a basis for the left null space. So you are given this space and you are given this space. From here, you can find a basis for this space and the basis from this space. Question is how? So if you find the row space and the column space, then you can create a matrix. That matrix will have to have the proper rank um, and so on. Okay, so the matrix A has null space and left null space given as follows. Find an example of a matrix A. So I'm not really asking you to find the column space and the row space. But I could just as well say that. So in order, so if you have the column space and the row space of a matrix, a basis for each, it's much easier to figure out an example of a matrix. But at the same time, you could, by playing to find the appropriate, um, to find an appropriate matrix, you will eventually have found a basis for the row space and column space. So. Uh, first things first, the null space of A tells us how many columns A has. So the fact that there are three components in the null space of A, I know that A has three columns. Because remember, the null space gives us combinations of the columns that add to zero. And the fact that the left null space has four components tells us that A has four rows, okay? Because the left null space tells us how to combine the rows to get zero. Now, what does, um, what does the null space tell us? It tells us that the first row, if we do first row minus third row, we're gonna get, sorry, column. Column one minus column three gives us zero. That's what the null space is telling us about the matrix A. It says, column one minus column two, sorry, three, gives us zero. What about the left null space? Well, the first vector in the left null space says row one plus row two plus row three plus row four add up to zero. So if I add all the four rows, I get zero. What about the second vector? Well, that one says, row 1 plus row 2 minus row 3 minus row 4 gives us 0. So if you think a little bit about this second equation, you could say row 1 plus row 2 add up to the same thing as row 3 plus row 4. So you could very well make this sum 0 and this sum 0. Then you would have these adding up to zero, because this would be zero and this would be zero, and you would have both of these simultaneously met. So how to use a bunch of uh, ones and zeros to get that going? All right, I'm going to take this on a new page. So I have these rules for my matrix. I need the rows to add up a certain way and I need the columns to add up the certain way and my matrix is four by three. 
So here's my A. Four rows. Well, four rows and three columns. And I know that actually you see column one minus column three being equal to zero simply says column one equals column two. What about the rank of A? Well, you see, if there is only one vector in the null space, that means that there is only one free column, which means there are two pivot columns. So the rank of the matrix is two. So I know that the first and the second column will be linearly independent, but the third column will simply be the same as the first one. So I can use a bunch of ones and zeros. Um, you wanna use as many ones and zeros as you possibly can. So if I put a one here, I should put a one here as well. The easiest thing to do is to use um, maybe even a reduced row echelon form of a matrix. So let's say this is zero, and then let's say this is one, and this is zero, and this is zero. Will that work? Well, not with the plan of having row one plus row two be a zero, but that's okay. Um, they don't have to be zero, as long as when I add row three and row four, um, I get zeros. So I need my rows to add up to get zero. So if I put here negative one, zero, negative one, and then zero, negative one, zero, I think I have enough things adding up. So first things first, I need to make sure that the first column is the same as the third column they're the same. Great. Now this says I need to add up the columns, which means I need to have row one and minus row one. I need to have row two and minus row two. So let's say row three will be minus row one and row four will be minus row two because I want to get an easy zero. There are different ways to combine these things, with, but why not use something really easy? And then this one says that if I add up the first two rows, I should get the same as adding up the last two rows. Okay, here I see that I have a problem. Okay, why do I have a problem? Because if I add these two rows, I don't get the same thing as if I add those two rows. So this is a problem. Okay, I'm seeing an easy fix. Maybe I can switch these two as a starting point. So have row one, and minus row one. So minus one, zero, minus one. Then my first and second row add up to zero. And then I can have zero, one, zero, zero, negative one, zero. So now row three and row four add up to zero. So I have this is zero and row three plus row four is zero. So the sum of the first two rows is the same as the sum of the last two rows. And when I add all four rows, I get zero. So this works. This um, matrix is has the right row space and column space. So playing a little bit, we get a basis for the rows and the columns. If I want to write a basis for the column space of A, now I can. Even though this matrix A is not unique, the column space of this matrix is the same. Um, like any A which has this null space and left null space will have the same column space and row space, even though the matrices may look different. Like if I combine somehow the rows and columns, things can be different. So I can say here that the column space of A is, so I want a basis. Well, the first two columns are linearly independent. No point in looking at the third one. So I have this. And then 0, 0, 1, negative 1. And this is possibly different from what I had in the solutions. I'm not sure. And then the row space will have the first and the third column. Right? So 1, 0, 1, and 0, 1, 0. You can quickly, quickly check that these vectors are orthogonal. So the vectors with three components are, should be orthogonal to the null space, 
and the vectors with four components should be orthogonal to the left null space. So that's how we found a vector, uh, an example of a matrix A. Now part B does not depend on you solving part A, so we're not going to use A at all to solve part B. If we consider the vector B here, for what values of alpha and beta, if any, does the system AX equal to B have a solution? Will the solution, if it exists, be unique? So before I find uh, the conditions on B or the values alpha and beta, I just want to say that in order for AX equals B to have a solution, B must be in the column space of A. And the solution is unique if and only if A has a zero null space. Since the null space of A is not zero, you know that if a solution exists, the solution will not be unique. So if there is a solution, it is not unique. That part you can do even without solving the problem. So for part B, we start by saying AX equals B has a solution if B is in the column space of A. But remember, the column space of A is orthogonal to the left null space. So we can say that B is in the orthogonal complement of the left null space, or rather B is orthogonal to the left null space. How do I check if B is orthogonal to the left null space? Well, I simply need to check that B is orthogonal to the basis that I'm given. So if you recall, the left null space has 1, 1, 1, 1, and 1, 1, negative 1, negative 1 as a basis. So I need to make sure that B is orthogonal to these two vectors. My vector B is given by, what was it? Minus 1, alpha, 0, beta. So I need minus 1, alpha, 0, beta times 1, 1, 1, 1 to give me 0. So what is this? This is just minus 1 plus alpha plus beta. This is 0. And I also need minus 1, alpha, 0, beta times 1, 1, negative 1, negative 1, which equals negative 1 plus alpha minus beta to also equal 0. You can solve this system however you like. I will just point out to the fact that you have negative 1 plus alpha equals negative beta, and then negative 1 plus alpha equals beta. So here, or you could just add these two up if you like these two equations, and you will see that beta has to be 0, or beta disappears, which tells you that minus 1 plus alpha must be 0 and therefore beta must be zero. So we have, however you want to solve this system, alpha is a one, beta is a zero from those two equations. And we say um, the solution is not unique because, you have to tell me why, because the null space of A is not zero. So there is something in the null space, you can always make another solution. Okay, we're given a vector C with three components, and we say it can be projected into two of the four fundamental subspaces of A. Which ones? Well, you're simply looking at the respective sizes. So uh, clearly you can project it onto the null space. The null space has three components. And then what is the orthogonal complement of the null space? Well, it is the row space. So C can be projected. Is there any room here? Maybe a new page. The vector C, it has three components, can be projected. onto the null space of A and the row space of A. And the vector was 1, 2, negative 3. 
it's easier to find first the projection onto the null space uh, because the null space ha is generated by only one vector. So the null space is just a span of the vector 1, 0, negative 1. So it's easier to find the projection of C onto the null space. So let P be the projection of C onto the null space of A. Then C minus P, I could maybe call it the error term, is the projection onto the row space. So you see, you don't have to find projections. You don't have to work with those two vectors. The key is applying the elementary, uh, the fundamental theorem of linear algebra. So if I project that vector C onto the null space of A, I know that my vector C is the sum of its projection onto the null space plus the projection onto the row space. So if I have one vector, I have the other automatically. You don't need to find the two projections. So how do you find the projection? I mean, this is projection onto a line, if you like, or onto a single vector, uh, no big deal. There is a formula for that. So the projection is a multiple of the vector one, zero, one. Uh, what multiple will that be? So a multiple of one, zero, negative one. I don't want to give any more um, labels to vectors. So I'm just going to write them here. We have maybe, so we need dot products, right? We have the vector one, two, negative three times the vector one, zero, negative one over one, two, negative three times one, two, negative three. And we get on top, we have one plus three. So that's a four. And in the denominator, we have one plus four plus nine. That is 14 times the vector one, zero, negative one. I could write two sevens, but it doesn't matter. You can just leave it like that. And then the other projection, because you've already explained. So giving me this statement is half the marks because you understand what you're doing. You're explaining that you know what's going on. So here, if you make some computational errors, it's not the end of the world. It's okay. So we found P. Now to find E, I just subtract 1, 2, negative 3. No, sorry. I need, yes, that's the vector C. Minus 4 fourteenths of 1, 0, negative 1. And that is whatever it is. I don't really don't care about the numbers. You can use calculators. I don't care. All right. In part D, find the projection matrix onto the column space of A. Now, here, really, if you use this matrix A, whatever you found, right, it could be this or another matrix A, but it will be four by three. And you know that this matrix has rank two. So only the first two columns are linearly independent, whereas this one is linearly dependent. To find the projection matrix, you can use just the first two columns of A. Of course, for the projection matrix, you could also use um, the three columns, but, or could you? Eventually things will disappear. The point is that it's better to use another matrix, let's say the matrix B, which will have only the first two columns of A. You should not use more than the first two columns of A to project onto the column space of A. So for part D, I will say let B equal this matrix 1, negative 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, negative 1. And if you notice, this matrix A has, uh, this matrix B has orthogonal columns, which is really nice. And in fact, if I divide it, these two columns have the same length. They both have length root 2. So if, div if I divide B by root 2, so if I do uh, 
1 over root 2, then the columns of b will be orthonormal. So then b transpose b will be the identity. You can test this. And the column space of a is the same as the column space of b. The row spaces are different, but the column spaces are the same. Okay. So if you look at this picture of the fundamental theorem of linear algebra, what you will have for the matrices A and B is that these are the same, but these are different. So you can have different uh, vector. Well, it's not even the same subspace. Uh, here we would have R3, whereas in the case of the matrix B, we will be working with R2. But these spaces will map here and then from the other matrix. So you have another picture here mapping to the same decomposition of R4. So using this matrix B is much easier. Now you don't have to normalize, this is not necessary. If you normalize, so if B is normalized, if you have this B transpose B, the computations are a little bit easier. But ultimately, no matter whether you use um, just the pivot columns of whatever matrix A you found, which may or may not be orthogonal, or you use it normalized, your, your projection matrix is given by B times B transpose B inverse. I think this is B transpose. And that's B. And I suppose, yes, okay, here, uh, it is very important that you take these columns to be linearly independent. If you take the matrix A, the third column is the same as the first. Your B transpose B will not be invertible and then you will run into trouble. You cannot find the projection matrix. So you can only find a projection matrix under the assumptions, the assumption that the columns in B are linearly independent. So you have to choose a matrix that consists of only the pivot columns of your matrix A, but the same columns so that the column spaces will be preserved. Now, because of my choice with this 1 over root 2 for b, I get that b transpose b is the identity, so I know that this part is not interesting. It's just um, the identity. And is this how it works? Am I mixing up the formula? Yeah, I think I am. Sorry. This should be b, b transpose. Yes, this is the projection matrix. Okay, so the inner part is just the identity. So really, I have B, B transpose. So whenever you choose a matrix B whose columns are orthonormal, then the projection matrix onto the column space of that matrix is simply B, B transpose. So to calculate this projection matrix, I simply go... Uh, so both matrices will have a, f a component 1 over root 2. When I multiply, I'll get 1 half. 1, negative 1, 0, 0. 0, 0, 1, negative 1. Times 1, negative 1, 0, 0. 0, 0, 1, negative 1. That will be 1 half times a 4 by 4 matrix, which will be of rank 2. So I will get a 1 here, a negative 1 there, a 0, 0, then a negative 1, a 1, and 0, 0, then 0, 0, 1, negative 1, 0, 0, negative 1, 1. Okay, now anything else we needed to find? So that is the projection matrix onto the column space of A. You could find, so let's say you didn't find a general matrix A here. You weren't able to do that. You can solve B and C without having found part A. That's definitely the case. How can you find a projection matrix onto the column space of A? without having a basis for the column space. So this is the key. You can find a projection matrix onto the left null space. Let's say you call that matrix T. How do you find it? In the exact same way, except that instead of using um, these two columns, 
you will use the two columns from the left null space. That matrix will project onto the left null space. So that matrix will project onto this space. If you have a matrix that is a projection matrix onto the column space, I minus P is a projection onto the left null space. If you have a matrix Q, for example, projecting onto the left null space, I minus Q projects onto the column space. So you see the way these matrices, the way the vectors split into B equals P plus E, you have the projection matrices split into say P plus Q equals the identity. So that's how the projection matrix is split because what you project onto here plus what you project onto here better be the original vector B that you started with because that vector B is in RM. So it splits into a projection in the left null space plus a projection into the column space. So multiple ways to solve everything. Uh, really, you could have solved B, C, and D without having solved part A. Although part A did make some things easier. And I think this is the last problem. Okay, so a few more minutes and we are done. We have the following Markov matrix. Find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So since the matrix A is Markov, we know that lambda 1 is 1. All my Markov matrices have lambda 1 equals 1. And the corresponding eigenvector will be just 1, 1. And then what about the second eigenvalue? Well, we use the trace of A. The trace of A is 0.9 plus 0.6, which is 1.5. And the trace of A is lambda 1 plus lambda 2. Since lambda 1 is 1, it turns out that lambda 2 must be 1 half. What is the corresponding eigenvector? Well, I can't do it just... Um, by, by heart like here, uh, x1 is clear because all Markov matrices have a vector of ones corresponding to the eigenvalue equal to one. So we can test that this is so if you want. Let me just find uh, the eigenvalue for lambda two equal to 0.5, then eigenvector in the null space of a minus 0.5 times the identity. So a minus 0.5i equals, I subtract 0.5 along the diagonal, I have 0 0.4, 0 0.4, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, and you see that the corresponding eigenvector would be something like 1, negative 1, or the other way around, it doesn't matter. So that's how the two columns combine to give a zero. Uh, how can we double check that x1 is doing the trick? We'll subtract a one along the diagonal and see what happens. Um, hmm, I might be wrong with that x1 vector. I shouldn't. Or maybe that works only in the case of symmetric matrices. So let me, okay, here we have the case for lambda 2, we found x2. Now I'm going to check that this is so. I might be wrong. So when lambda 1 is 1, the eigenvector is in the null space of a minus i. So a minus i equals, we have 0.9 minus 1, that's negative 0.1. 0.4, yeah, I'm wrong, that's not the vector 1, 1. And then we have 0.1, negative 0.4. So the corresponding eigenvector, so this is wrong, I'm not going to erase it because I want you to pay attention, that's not the case, my bad. So here, what would work? Think of this as being negative 1 and a 4, or 1 and negative 4. A vector that has 4, 1 will do the trick. So 4, 1 works. We have x2. Okay, we solved part A. Given the vector u naught, 
with components 3, 2, compute uk, which is a to the k u0, what is u infinity? So we did this. Sim it's very similar to the previous problem that we did with eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So in part b, u0 has components 3, 2, and we know that if we combine it with the eigenvectors uh, x1 and x2, so we have c1 x1 plus c2 x2 equals u0, and we're trying to find c1 and c2. So we have a matrix consisting of the eigenvectors times c1 c2 equals 3, 2. I just need to check what x1 and x2 were. So x1 is 4, 1, x2 is 1, negative 1. 4, 1, 1, negative 1. And I happen to find a symmetric uh, eigenmatrix. I'm going to use Kramer's rule because it's convenient. So C1 equals the determined 3, 2, 1, negative 1, 4, 1, 1, negative 1. I'm going to compute what this is. So we have minus 3, minus 2, negative 4, minus 1. So conveniently, negative 5 over negative 5, which is a 1. C2 equals 4, 1, 3, 2. 4, 1, 1, negative 1. I know that the denominator is negative 5. The numerator is 8 minus 3, which is a 5. So we get negative 1. So we have C1 and C2. So I have U0 equals X1 minus X2. And perhaps that could have been also obtained by observation. Um, yeah, X2 minus X. Oops, I think. Sorry, this should be X1. All right, and now what is uk? Okay, so the vector u sub k is obtained by applying a to the k onto u0, which is the same as applying a to the k onto x1 minus x2, which is a to the k x1 minus a to the k x2. Since x1 and x2 are eigenvectors, we get lambda 1 to the k x1 minus lambda 2 to the k x2. Now, lambda 1 is equal to 1. So this whole thing is just 1. Whereas lambda 2 is 1 half. So we have x1 minus 1 half to the power k x2. So this is u sub k. We see that u sub k does depend on k. Okay, it's not constant. Now, what about u infinity? Well, u infinity is what you get is the limit of u sub k as k goes to infinity. Essentially, if this is a very big number, so you have 0.5 to the power of very big number, like imagine million, billion, really, really big. The higher the k, the smaller one half to the power k. So actually, as k goes to infinity, this expression goes to zero. So this will go to zero as k goes to infinity. So this goes to zero as k goes to infinity. I, I write an arrow because I say it approaches zero as k goes to infinity. Infinity is not a real number, so we don't replace it. So the limit of uk is simply x1. That's all it is. And x1 had components for 1. So if I start this Markov matrix with the vector 3, 2, and I apply a over and over and over and over again, all I'm going to get is this vector x1 with components for 1, which is one of the stationary directions that don't change under applications of the matrix a. Okay, that is all I had prepared for a review. You have a lot to study, but do, do make sure to review uh, all the other exercises from the reviews and everything I've solved in class, not just things assigned for homework.
Good luck on the test.